from the study so far? basic gist of it that they wasn't really on the right path and he had to try to straighten them out and he was writing letters oh, to them yeah. to show them where they were deviating and where they were mixing with the Jews and the Jews were actually trying to um, be with the other Jews and you know going against the, the Gentiles and so forth and trying to mix some of the things, trying yeah. to pacify yeah. the strict re religious Jews, yeah. and they're trying to mix and match. That's, right. that's awesome. And very good. Them, that's not happening. That's right. <laughs> Paul was very clear that's on right. that. That's it, babe. You know, there is no Jew nor Gentile in the Lord, no bond or free, that's no right. slave. God said, we are one. And when the Gentiles began to start getting saved, the Judaizers were coming in and trying to put the right. traditions, the customs on it. Yeah. You got to do this. You got to do that. You need to be circumcised. And Paul said, "No, you got it wrong. Right. You got it wrong. Let's straighten this out. Let's walk in unity." And this morning, we're going to consider that as our precept. And Ronnie did a great job recapping it. The Judaizers were trying to make them follow the old covenant. But Paul was there to say, we live in the new covenant right, that right. Jesus has provided us, and we are free. So with that, let's open to Galatians chapter 4. I'm going to be reading the first seven verses this morning out of the NLT. It says, think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up even though they actually own everything their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age the father has set. And that's the way it was for us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Amen. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Amen. Again, Paul's covering here to the Galatian church. We are no longer under the old covenant. We now live in the new. The old covenant of the law had been fulfilled by Jesus, and now we were in the dispens dis dispensation, I'll get it out, of living by grace in the new covenant. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9 says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it's a gift from God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Again, we cannot fulfill the law. It's not by our works that we get saved, but it's a gift from God unto us. Amen? Amen. So Paul begins with this analogy. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance to his children, and the children are you too young to receive the benefits at that time, they're considered the same as slaves. Why? Because they have to obey the laws that are set before them. They're placed under a tutor or a guardian until that time which the Father has set. This is how he's teaching the Galatians to understand that they were like young children, subject to the laws and the rules of the Old co Covenant being ordered around almost as slaves as they were in bondage. They were in bondage to the elements of the world and basic spiritual truths of the world. Okay, Pastor, what are you saying? Bondage to basic spiritual principles of the world. What does that mean? Well, we looked it up in Bible Believer's Commentary and it breaks it down a little for us. It means that the elementary principles of Jewish religion, the ceremonies, the rituals, 
These were designated for those who do not know God as the Father as he is revealed in Christ. An illustration for this would be teaching a child how to read. Has anybody ever taught a child how to read? Did you ever play with a little box? D-O-G, dog. G-O-D, God. And you play with the blocks and you play with the visuals for them to begin to grasp and start identifying. You might learn and show them pictures. This is a giraffe. This is a fox. This is an elephant. You may not be standing in front of an elephant, but they can learn elephant by the visuals. And what Paul was doing is saying, I'm comparing the law to that. See, the law was set up as rules and regulations foreshadowing Christ's coming. The law was there as a mirror to show us where we're right and wrong. How many can keep all Ten Commandments without any problem? None of us. Okay, let's look back at the law. Who can keep all 660 plus laws of the Old Testament? No, it was punish. It was there as a foreshadow for them to understand and see as pictures, appealing to our spiritual sense through the physical realm. We grab the concept of where we fall short by hearing these laws, but we could not fulfill them. They could not fulfill them. The Jewish Custom was once a year they'd come and slaughter a lamb and it would be a scapegoat where they'd all put their hands on that lamb and believe that their sins were being transferred to that lamb and then the lamb would be crucified. And all the pet lovers are upset now. Sorry, the lamb was the visual of Christ the lamb. See, God was using building blocks, as it were, or flashcard pictures, as it were, for us to make sense. The law was shadows and pictures appearing, appealing to our spiritual sense by the means of the physical. It was external. One of the things that grabbed me the most about Jaden is how God reveals to him spiritual concepts through the external world. This was my first experience of this. I grew up in the church. I knew the law. I understand the old covenant. I grew up knowing that Jesus came and saved me and that he fulfilled the law. But Jaden, as a young child, he couldn't have been more than three or four years old. He was very young. And I had a beginner's Bible, my first Bible, something along that line. And we'd sit in bed and we'd read it. And so, of course, we're reading, and Jesse was laughing the other week. They did the lesson on the plagues of Egypt, and um, Ariel loved the blood mask. I am the blood. You know, and, and kids sometimes get it, sometimes don't. But as I was reading the story of the plagues of Egypt and what was happening, and then how they had to go in and have dinner and take the blood of the lamb and the hyssop and apply it to the doorposts, on the sides and above and around, and then they ate the lamb and they had to be ready to go. Jaden, at three or four years old, looks at me and goes, huh, that's just like Jesus. He says, Jesus is our lamb. His blood covers us. It covers us. And I thought, oh my God, only the Spirit of the Lord could reveal it to a three-year-old or a four-year-old. He grabbed the concept of the spiritual by looking and reading and understanding the external. And that's what the old, co old Covenant did for us. It brought the law, it brought us understanding, it brought us to understand where we fall short, it brought us to understand what God's expectations were, but it also brought us to our knees to say, we can't do this. It brought bondage. It brought a heaviness. Have you ever struggled going into your prayer closet because you feel like you failed? We're in the new covenant, people. There's grace. God loves us. I can't imagine the heaviness they would have felt. Circumcision, and Paul was addressing this in the beginning of the book, circumcision was another example of an outward act representing a spiritual process. 
Circumcision of the flesh was a cutting away of the foreskin. But the reason God had them do it was he wanted them to know that our heart needs its flesh cut off. We need to have a heart after the Spirit of God. And when we go into the waters of baptism, we believe there's a circumcision that happens in our heart where our old ways, our old nature, our stubborn will to do things our way and break every sin and law begins to get removed and there's a surgery process. We die with Christ, we are raised with Christ, and we are set free to walk in freedom. And again, the Jewish laws are physical, external, and temporal. But when we come to Christianity, when we come to the New Covenant, we have to understand that Christianity is spiritual, internal, Amen. and permanent. Yes. So there's the old, there's the new. How many are happy we live in the new? Amen. I do. These external foreshadows were bondage, but at the appointed time, I love it, just as Paul's story goes, at the appointed time, the Father, had declared and decided he sent Jesus his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. So when Jesus comes humbly, born into humanity, under the same bondages of the law, he became with the purpose to fulfill the law, as well as provide freedom from the law. All 660 laws, plus, Jesus was the only one that lived this earth and fulfilled them. He didn't break one of them. That's amazing. That is only God in the flesh. He lived. He came. He put on humanity. He humbled himself to be a servant, even to the bonds of death, so that we could be free. Freed from the law. Jesus paid the ultimate price for all who were slaves to sin, all who were bound by the law, so that we may not only live free, but what does Paul teach us here? He teaches us not only are we free and under the new covenant, we're no longer slaves, we're children of God. He has adopted us. Jesus was the firstborn among many brethren. Do you know you got a big brother? I don't know about you. Growing up, I always wanted older brothers. I don't know why. I was the oldest. I had to protect everybody. I had to do it all. I just wanted older brothers to talk to. It didn't happen. But Jesus is my older brother. And I can go to him and talk to him. And he takes it to the Father. Woo! Nobody can pick on me now. <laughs> John 1, 12 through 13 in the NIV puts it this way. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or the husband's will, but born of God. Did you catch that? As children of God, when we become saved, when we become adopted into the family of God, and that's why, I don't know if you've heard it, but I grew up through the 70s. Everybody was brother and sister. Brother Ronnie, Sister Pam, yeah. Sister Janet, Brother Kirk. Why? Because we recognize we are the family of God. Amen. We're one blood. We're under one covering. We all have the same daddy. The Father in heaven. Amen? Amen. But it says children. Born not of a natural descent, nor of a human decision, or a husband's will, but we are born of God. Amen. That's something to rejoice about, amen? amen? Paul goes on to explain this concept deeper in a way that helps us grip this even more. We're going to jump down to verse 21, Galatians 4, we're in. 21 to 31, it says, Tell me, I'm reading in the New Living Translation, Tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? The scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. 
The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born of God's own fulfillment of his promise. These two women serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. Remember, external, to speak to something spiritually internal. The first woman, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai, where the people received the law that enslaved them. And now Jerusalem is just like Mount Sinai in Arabia because she and her children live in slavery to the law. But the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is a free woman, and she is our mother. As Isaiah said, Rejoice, O childless woman, you who never gave birth. Break into joyful shout, you who have never been in labor. For the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. And you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of the promise, just like Isaac. But you are now being persecuted by those who want to keep you on the law, just like Ishmael. The child born of human effort persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Spirit. But what do these scriptures say about that? Paul's challenging them. See, he's going into their Jewish traditions and says, you want to look at the law? Let's talk about this. Abraham had two boys, Ishmael and Isaac. So he challenges them. What do the scriptures have to say about this? Get rid of the slave and her son, and the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. So dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, we are children of the free woman. Amen? Amen? Here we are. Paul is speaking to the history of the Jews, Abraham and his two sons. Ishmael, born of a slave woman, Hagar, out of a human attempt to bring God's promise. We've all heard that, right? How many times do we make human attempts to bring about the promise of God? Yeah. Ouch! Ishmael's mother, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai. Where was Mount Sinai? Where was the law it was given? When Moses got the Ten Commandments, he was up on Mount Sinai. It's where the people learned, in a sense, that they were breakers of the law. It brought bondage. It brought understanding to where they fell short. Bondage and the Old Covenant through human effort. <laughs> Isaac, born of the free woman, Sarah, born of God's own fulfillment of his promises, Isaac's mother, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. Are we there yet? No, but we're going. Yes. We're going to that heavenly Jerusalem where there's no bondage. The new covenant is represented in this, where freedom is born by what? The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God births us in freedom. The Spirit of God births us in the New Covenant. The Spirit of God is what gives us our freedom as children of God. Again, the law came to teach us what sin was and how our own efforts, we can never accomplish it. But Jesus came and completed all the laws, remained sinless. Then he broke the bondages of sin, which held us captive. How many know we are so thankful for the work of the cross? Amen? Amen. Amen. Paul goes on to teach us basically get rid of the slave mentality. We are no longer slaves. Amen. Understand this, children of God. We are children of God. We are not slaves. Right. I don't care what your heritage is. I don't care what your background is. I don't care where you came from. We are one blood, we are one race, we are God's children, and we are not slaves, we are free. We are free people indeed. No one with the mindset of bondage or slavery will inherit the promises and the blessings of God. 
Galatians 4.31 said, So, dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of the free woman. This is now where we can come in as adopted children, children of freedom, heirs of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are free. We are free today. I don't care what the enemy tells you about how you broke a law this morning. You're free. You're forgiven. It's under the blood. Christ paid the price. All you have to do is come back and say, God, I'm sorry. I messed up again. I fell. I tripped. I went backwards. Forgive me. But you're free. That freedom never changes. Jesus, when he was alive, taught the disciples to pray this in Matthew 6.6. 6. And we learned while we were studying the Lord's Prayer that this was a radical concept for the disciples to grasp hold of. We think of it so easy. Matthew 6.6, 6, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And we can almost jump past that. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But what Jesus was teaching the disciples was, you don't have to fear to come in God's presence. You don't have to be afraid to enter the Holy of Holies. Now the veil had not been ripped yet. Jesus would do that when he died on the cross. The veil tore from the top down. And we have access to the throne room of God. But what he was teaching his disciples is, I'm getting ready to leave and I want to teach you how to pray. And the first thing you need to understand is it's God wants to talk to you. God, your father, your daddy, wants to hear your voice. Jessica, how much does daddy want to hear your voice? A lot. A lot. That phone call, that stopping by. How many fathers in here like to hear their daughter's voices? We want to have communication with God. Why? First of all, because he desires it with us. Yes. Jesus taught them the prayer by understanding that God is inviting us into his throne room. God is inviting us to come in and pray. God is looking for us to communicate with him. We talked about it on the Bible study, how the Holy Spirit is with us all the time. He's external, walking beside us. He's internal, living within us. He's dealing with anything outside realm. He's dealing with anything inside realm. But he looks for us to talk to him. If Tiny and Jessica spent the whole day together, and Jessica didn't say a word to Tiny, Tiny, how would you feel? Not good. Not good. <laughs> I just spent the whole day with this woman, and she didn't say a word to me. And we have to remember that the Holy Spirit's with us. He's walking all day with us. Do we talk to him? Do we make time for him? And God's the same way. Our Father, the throne room is open. Come see me. Come. Come, my children. Come see me. Our Father in heaven. He taught the disciples, rethink this, because you are now children of God. And God has broke the veil or is about to break the veil, and he wants you to come in. The best example I can give this because, again, we're talking about how earthly examples give light to spiritual things. The best example I can give this is President John F. Kennedy. Everybody's looking at me like, what? what? JFK would be in the Oval Office. How many know the Oval Office is a place of honor, respect? Not anybody can just walk in the Oval Office. You have to have a meeting. You have to have it on the schedule. Even his wife didn't go in and interrupt. But there was one person who had access all the time. John Jr. There's pictures of him playing under his father's desk as his dad is writing important letters. There's pictures of him riding the tricycle in the Oval Office. Can you imagine the staff? What, what, what is he doing here? He's my son. He has every right to be here. And to me, that's a spiritual example of how the Father treats us. We have access to the throne room of God any time we want. That's right. Why? Because we are his children. 
We are free to play in his presence. We are free to sing and dance in his presence. It doesn't matter what he's dealing with, what's going on. He's our daddy. He's got it covered. We come, come, come into the presence of God as free children. We too have that relationship with God. Hebrews 4.16 says it this way. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. See, the enemy still lies to us. He likes, just like the Judaizers in Paul's day, he wants us to believe that we're still slaves. That God is lording over us, and when we get out of line, did you ever get paddled as a kid? I did. I got paddled a lot. And I was a good kid, really. I, I was one of those kids that kind of flew under the radar. I never rebelled to their face. I never let them know that I was out of order. And I still got paddled a lot. My sister was blazing. I don't like what you have to say. So the biggest trick she used to do, which was hysterically funny, my mother was very strict. Darlene, you're allowed on the front porch. Darlene is 12 years old. You cannot leave the front porch unless I'm out there. Still on the porch. <laughs> what are you going to do? I'm still there. She would push buttons. I was not a button pusher. I was like, shh. I'd fly right under where they think I was. But I got paddled a lot by my mom. My dad never. All he had to do one day is say, I'm disappointed. And I just wanted to wait and cry because I had let my dad down. But I remember being 12 years old. How many remember those ping pong paddle balls? Oh, yeah. I don't know what I did to get my mother mad, but she took one out of the drawer. Whack! Broken half. I just stood there and looked at her. She pulled out another one. Whack! Broken half. I just stood there. She did the third one. I looked at her and said, are you through yet? Oh! I was in trouble then. <laughs> I was in trouble then. But see, sometimes we relate that to God. We think we make a mistake and we're expecting the paddle to come out. We're expecting that we're going to get beat upside the head because we broke law. And Paul was trying very clearly to let people know, no, you're free. The law has been broken by the power of Christ. You are free. Will you fall down? Will you make mistakes? Yeah, but you got access to the throne room of your dad. You're his children. Don't let the enemy hinder you from running to the throne room of God because you got full access. Just like John Jr. went into the Oval Office and played and had fun, we can go into the throne room of God and worship and sing and talk to our daddy. And the door is open. He's waiting to hear from us. That's how much he loves us. I want to end today with John 3, verse 1a in the NIV. It says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Amen? Amen. We are God's children. With that, let's stand today. I want to pray and I want to close for anybody who's struggling with the mindset of the law. <clears throat> You're struggling with the mindset that when you make a mistake, and we all do, we all know we do, that God's going to whack us over the head the minute we fall. God is not like that. He loves us. If you've given your heart to Christ, you're his son, you're his daughter. God wants you to live in freedom and enjoy. And yes, we will make mistakes. Has anybody here ever gone a whole day without breaking the law somewhere? I just wanted to shake your hand if that was you because I haven't been able to. I try. <laughs> I try to live for God the best I can, but we're human. We fall. Yes. We make mistakes. But that does not stop our access to his throne room where he wants to lavish 
His love on us. First John says it, with great love, the Father has lavished on us because He loves us, because we're His children. So this morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you struggle with that today, just put your hand up before the Lord. I'm not even looking. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word. God, we thank you that the old covenant has been demolished, Lord. That Jesus came and fulfilled every law on my account. And then he went to the cross where my sins were nailed upon him. God, he bled and died for me that I might be free. Lord, he was the firstborn among all of us, brothers and sisters in the family of God. And Father, we have our freedom today because of the work you did through your son. God, not only did he die, but he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He rose again, and he gave us access into your presence. He gave us an open door where sin doesn't have to separate. His blood covers us so we can freely come in and commune with you. Lord, help us to understand today and let us help us understand the mindset, God, that your blood has been applied to our lives and as the veil was torn, you taught your disciples to pray, our Father, not Jesus' Father, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. God, help us to live in freedom and victory this week. That when we fall, that we come run into your presence. That when we're having a good day, we come run into your presence. When we're sad, we come running to your presence, Lord. When we're joyful and having fun, we come running into your presence, God. Because you're our dad. And you made us free. And you love us. And we long to be with you. Father, we look forward to that day when we will be in the new Jerusalem. We have no idea, no eye has seen, no man has understood what you've prepared for us. But God will live freely, eternally in the presence of the King. How wonderful is that? Teach us to enjoy it here, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.